Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. My name is uh, John Heedman Ead. Um, I'm a student at Columbia University. Uh, and uh, the topic I'm going to talk to you all about today is about planning for tomorrow. Um, how do you let someone who's maybe you in the future, maybe not you, uh, extend your CS Plus library and application uh, to do things that you know maybe you didn't intend, or to handle classes or functions or functionality that you didn't specifically intend? All right, so obviously the, the goals that we're going for here is obviously we're trying to add functionality, right? Um, whether it's to perform a semantically expected task for something like set swap, or whether you want to have callback functions to do some arbitrary amount of work, or whether you want to give a class like a specific compatible interface, like virtual protected functions and IO streams, uh, the whole point is to enable uh, developers to have a better, um, to enable developers to have a better time working with uh, your library, um, whether um, that's a standard library for set swap or a C library or IO streams or something else. So let's uh, take a look, just a quick brief overview of some of the uh, well-known extension methods that kind of everybody who goes through C++ or who learns C++ kind of already grok. Um, so obviously, there's virtual methods. Um, very straightforward. Uh, you know, I don't think um, anyone here really needs to be told how this works, but you know, you have a base class, you derive from it, you override the base functions, and you can endow it with specific functionality, specific to your type, right? And this is the, you know, the, the university example or the the blog example you always see when people are trying to teach CS plus, you know, they have animal dog or they have shape and circle and blah blah and stuff like that. Um, I mean, they're pretty well known and they were used extensively up until about 2008 and then usage of them started dropping off real fast. Um, a lot of the older game engines, uh, whether it's things like Ogre um, or Erlict or just app the applications themselves like Doom and other things have a lot of base classes, a lot of virtuals. Um, Qt is the whole hierarchy is one big virtual Shebang. Um, Clang's AST matchers and its essential points are based on virtual functions. The CSO standard library has IO streams and a couple other things. And you know, one too many, one too many CSO university classes for my for my liking. Um, so what are the what are the benefits of virtual functions, right? And 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 some of the the, the 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 biggest thing is that you can work with you know a a super class or the base class. Uh, uh, at compile time, right? Um, so you get to work with the base class at compile time, um, and you get the right method at runtime, right? When you call the, when you call uh, functions on this thing, um, and there's no need to kind of bookkeep function pointers or similar, right? The way that this worked in C is that you had to basically make a struct, put a bunch of function pointers in it, and then make sure you explicitly initialize all the function pointers with the things that you wanted, and then you know you work with them and called them, you know, uh, like they were, uh, the, like they would behave like virtual functions, like the with a syntax that looked like virtual functions, but uh, you know. Obviously, you do a lot of bookkeeping and everything else, and you know things got things. You could easily lose track of things or, or drop things on the floor. Um, we're lucky in that we live in a world today where the compilers heavily optimize some of the uh, simple cases for uh, virtual classes. So, if you've ever looked at a performance benchmark for uh, I/O streams compared to say the C, if you're using just raw C or something else. Um, you'll notice that they're actually very close in comparison. So you're not really paying that much cost or any cost at all for the virtuals that you know the entire IO streams hierarchy has in it. Um, and of course, there's a couple other places where it's used heavily. Like there's the CS Plus XAML framework that Microsoft released that makes a ton of use of virtuals, and so they rely heavily on devirtualization to make sure that it stays at least mildly competitive. And you know, there's a lot more cases. Drawbacks, of course, is that it's very brittle. It's very brittle for your binary interfaces, right? You add a function to a class that had virtual methods before, right? And you're like, okay, well, I just added a method to this class, right? No big deal. I'll just ship this out and everybody will be fine. Uh, the problem with that is that, you know, it might be at the end of your virtual table for your classes, right? But if somebody else or some customer out there derived from that class, uh, you just inserted a function in the middle of their virtual table, right? And so you just pushed all of their function calls down. So if they call an older, uh, binary, like an older DLL or an older program, and they expect this interface to be the right one, uh, it's not going to be the right one for their type. And so, you know, they'll start calling functions, and so like maybe half of them will work, and then the other half won't, and then everything goes to hell at runtime, and they're like, oh, what the hell is going on? And, you know, it gets very confusing. Um, you start calling functions that you never intended, and you're hitting breakpoints that you're like, I didn't call that, and, you know, it gets very crazy. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we can't fix I.O. streams uh, in the standard today. Um, there's a lot of things that we want to do to change it, but we actually can't because if we changing those virtual functions, or we add any new virtual functions, um, everything goes to hell uh, in a handbasket, um, which is great. Um, and by great, I mean we don't have to actually think about fixing our streams. We can just throw it all out and do something new, which is kind of good. Um, yeah, so again, implementation controls the virtual tables. There's slicing problems. Base class has to be handled by pointers or references. You can't have by value programming. All these kind of things come into play. So let's go to a different kind of uh, uh, paradigm here. 
um, callbacks with user data, right? This is the staple of C APIs everywhere, right? Um, the idea is that you know you have a function, um, you know. I have an example here of with a Lua where we have a, a type def for this thing called a Lua writer. And the idea is that it takes some data, um, a size of that data, and a void star. And that last void star is what's typically called your user data. Um, basically, the way any C API works is that you know, they can't afford to uh, have like a, there's no templates in C, right? You can't handle arbitrary number of classes, right? So the way that they handle this is they just have a void star pointer um, for their callbacks. And the idea is that you create whatever you want. Stuff, it, stuff the uh, address of that into a void star pointer, call this function with it, and then on the other side you uh, unwrap it back to the type that you want and then do what you want, do what you want to do with it. Um, this is used everywhere, right? Lua, libclang, libpng, libjpeg, libjanison, libev, uh, libuv, you know, even the standard library with qsort takes a function pointer that you're supposed to, that, uh, take that gives you its arguments by void star, and then you're supposed to cast out and work with the types as you see fit. Um, so this is pretty well known. Um, and the good thing is, is that's very easy to wrap up in C++, right? So this is a very, I'm, I'm using the, uh, the same code from here, right? I'm used with these two example functions. Um, the idea here is that I have this handler that can handle that, uh, it just what it, all it does is it casts from the callback that was given as a template type uh, to, uh, casts from the void star to the callback type, right? And then just calls the callback with the three, func with the three parameters that it needs, right? So, you know, the state, the data, and the size. Um, the way we wrap that up in CS Plus is that you know we you know get the function pointer that we need that we're going to pass to the raw C API, right? We make sure that we get the uh, handler that we get a handler to this that can handle this this arbitrary callback that we have. Um, we have to make sure that we remove the reference, otherwise this will be a uh, a this this dump handle will be templated on this being a reference, and you can't like pass that reference through. You have to pass like a, a either the pointer to it. Um, and so what we do here is we do the void star cast. We cast, get the address of the callback. We cast the void star, and that's our user data. And then we pass it all into Lua dump, right? Um, and that's and what happens is you know this C, the C API will call this function. We unwrap it. We unwrap everything, and then we just call it, right? Very easy to wrap these APIs. Um, and you can. And the idea here is that you can still use any arbitrary callback, right? So this works with the lambda. This works with the function pointer. This works with any callable, right? And so in this way, it's, it's very easy to make it extensible and, and type safe, right? You're, you're not the one working with the void pointer. The, the internals of the API are. You can improve this a little bit by getting rid of the template, right? Because so before we had a template type name callback, right? And maybe you're not going to call this with a lot of different things, right? Maybe you, or maybe you want to have this a fixed interface, right? So you can do this implementation inside of, like a, C, inside of a CP file, right? You don't want to have this sitting in a header and having to parse it all, all the time and everything else, right? You want to export the interface, right? So you can put it in std function. Uh, the problem with that is that std function is a little expensive. Um, so there's a new thing that was actually, there was a talk given here yesterday about uh, std function ref. Um, and it's on its way for CS plus 20, maybe. It depends on if the library working group gets to it. Um, but std function ref is the cheapest version of std function. Um, and so this allows you to have a, a, a API that you can export, you know, or m make it a DLL call or whatever you want, um, and still have all the flexibility that you want uh, from the previous. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? It's just, oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes, it, it, exactly. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of how we, we were able to raise the data and, and save ourselves some, uh, save ourselves some compile time and, you know, also have the ability to export the function and, you know, um, all the funness that comes with that. But there are some problems with this paradigm, right? Uh, Inline and synchronous execution, right? Like what we're doing here is that this function is going to call this one, and it's never going to return until it's until it's done calling this, right? And so I don't have to worry about lifetime here, right? That's why this could be std function ref, because I don't need to actually store this thing to hold it. I just need it to be alive for the duration of this call, right? And then by the time that this returns, right, it's never going to st call this anymore, right? So I don't need to worry about lifetime, right? None of that applies anymore. Um, it's also synchronous, right? And you know that applies that you know I don't get control back until it's done, right? The problem is that when you get to non-inline execution or asynchronous execution, um, or you end up in the the state that libev or qt end up in, right? You need to store it, right? So in that case, std function becomes mandatory, right? Because the implementation of this won't just be, you know, using a void star and then passing it. You will have to like store it somewhere and save it, right? And for that, std function becomes mandatory, right? The other thing is that. If you're doing multi-threading, you also need to store it so that you can call it from these other threads, right? Because at some point you need to be able to reference it. Um, and of course, you know, the fact of storage means you have lifetime problems, right? So, you know, you pass in a function to this, right? Uh, or the std function version, right? 
the question becomes, you know, are the variables that you capture in your lambda going to survive for the entire time that this is going to be called from maybe other threads? Is the thread safe to call from other threads, right? All these questions come up, right? So this API is nice, but it, and it's easy to use if it's all synchronous and inline, but if it's not, then you run into a lot of problems very quickly. Um, this is kind of what makes it very thorny to work with uh, C APIs. However, here's the benefits of it, right? It's space and time efficient, right? Especially if you never actually need to store the callback, right? If it's, you know, if you're always having inline and synchronous execution, uh, it's cheap. Function pointers are cheap, right? Like sid ref function ref is cheap, right? All of that stuff is very cheap and, and easy to, to come by. Um, it's also ABI hardy, right? It's very, very, very difficult to break the ABI unless you actually change the callback interface, right? So all of this, you know, and the, the idea is that with the void star, the user can place as much extra data as they want into the void star, and it's their responsibility to handle it, right? So you're not, as the library author, you're not responsible for whatever the user's doing in, in the callback, right? You don't need to think about lifetime, you don't need to do any storage, right? All you need to do is make sure the void star uh, just gets passed through, and the user can modify the, the, the input and the, the inner side and the outer side of that function when it gets called, uh, and in that way, it makes it very ABI hardy, right? So you can ship this interface, and it'll last for like 20 years, and everybody will keep using it, and it'll still be fine, right? That's, and those are, those, are some real, those are actually serious, like, considerable benefits to an interface like this. Drawbacks, uh, exceptions. Um, these are C APIs, but you know, as you can see from the, the code I wrote here, uh, that Lua dump is a C call, but my dump handler is not, right? So what if I toss an exception? Right, there's all these things, right? And so as you can see here, right, I don't have like any try catches, I don't have all of that, and I've, I've not handled exceptions, I've not handled early exit issues, right? All of that's kind of important. The other thing is, uh, you know, what happens when a C API ports failures, right? In, in most cases, in some, there are some libraries that are, that are kind of misbehaved in that when they, uh, they don't call your function when there's a failure, right? They only call it when you know, the things go right. And so what happens is the function will exit, um, and you won't know that the function failed, right? So if you allocated something and you passed it into that void star, well, when was I supposed to delete that, right? And those are all kinds of questions that you have to start answering for yourself. Um, also, inlining. Uh, if you have function pointers or compiled function calls everywhere, um, you can defeat the inliner uh, quite a few times. Um, and this is, this is the primary reason why the C standard library's qsort is slower than std sort, right? Because it gets to inline your callables and your predicates and everything else, and so it's all inline. It can optimize the hell out of that. Um, qsort, not so much. It you know, might go into a compiled DLL call, then it comes out on the other side with these void pointers. It doesn't know. You're at the cast. You know, that's aliasing, blah, blah, blah. It's very hard for the, the you're making the compiler's life a little, lot harder. Um, and of course, lifetime issues and most threading issues. But that's kind of a brief overview of the stuff that we already know about. Let's talk about the stuff that's interesting, the more spicy stuff, the stuff that goes into the ranges, the stuff that goes you know, in uh, the stuff in the, the libraries that we're shipping today, and std hash and all of that stuff. So there's a couple different extension methodologies that you can use kind of at compile time, right? that the compiler assists you with, that the compiler helps you do. Um, and those things are partial class template specializations. Um, there's also ADL, or Koenig lookup. Um, a subset of that is static friend functions. And there's also just raw template functions with overloading. Right? And all of those are compiler assisted, right? The compiler has the name lookup rules, the compiler has the overload resolution rules, right? It helps you pick the right things, and you have to play by its rules. Then there's the other side of that, which is uh, much simpler, which is the author mandated, right? Where you have traits or policy or agent templates, part of a class or an interface, and all you do is you just say, this is the interface, you have to, co you have to abide by the interface, and if not, then you're out of luck, right? And that's just how that works, right? So there's one that's purely author mandated that's kind of just helped by the fact that you supply the template, and the other one is compiler assisted, right? And some of these can overlap and nest and whatever else. Um, the, we're going to talk about class templates and specializations, but for the duration of this talk, we're basically going to be working with this very simple struct, right? Struct two things in A uh, bool B, right? Not a very fantastic or exciting struct, but we're going to use it to kind of illustrate all the points of these various different extension methodologies. Um, the first one up, obviously, is uh, class templates and specialization of them. Um, the idea is that you partially specialize the template, and for this we're going to do a couple case studies. So one is going to be my library, Sol2, and the other library is going and the other library is going to be std hash, right, which is in the standard. So let's drill a little bit into these case studies and what they do. Uh, here's uh, some older code from Sol2, um, where uh, we have the struct called getter, and basically, you know, if you couldn't tell by the name, the whole point is supposed to yank something out of the Lua state, right? It's supposed to pull out, it's supposed to get something, right? And so the idea is I have a template, I have a default implementation, um, it's in my namespace soul stack, and that's it. Now, you may notice that, you know, aside from just having this initial template type name T, we also have this type name C equals void, right? And we're going to explain why we have this extra template parameter sitting around on, on this, this struct. 
But the idea here is that you can specialize this for your type, right? Um, I get to say, for the getter, I'm going to use the two things struct that we were talking about before. And so return two things from this get function, take all the arguments, my user code goes there, I close the namespace, right? So the way I open this, I open the namespace, I define a, a full specialization of this getter struct, and I close the namespace, right? And so it doesn't look too complicated, right? Then let's say we get something a little bit more exciting, where we decide that we're going to have an implementation uh, for all the numerics, right? You know, Lua itself stores all numbers as doubles, right? So I should just add a cast a double and stuff it in Lua, and then I can do that for all arithmetic types, right? Because, well, that's what I should do. Um, and so that's what the implementation looks like, right? And so this is where that, that uh, the type name C from here, this is where this kicks in. Um, so as you can see, we have the, the struct getter. We're saying that we're taking any arbitrary type name T, right? So it, technically, right now, it matches everything. But then we ap apply this, this, uh, this stood enable if blah type, and we give it a Boolean value, um, which is this is arithmetic underscore V, uh, takes a type and reports whether it's a arithmetic type or not, and it gives us a true or a false. And once we get the true or the false, we, sub it we substitute it into the standard enable if type. Now, the way stood enable if works is that it basically is templated on a single Boolean. And it says, or a Boolean and, and optionally a type. And what it says is, uh, if the Boolean is true, then I'm going to have an internal type, an uh, internal member called colon colon type, right? So I, there's a there's a member called type. There's a, a type def called uh, type on there that has uh, uh, that has the value, uh, has a, the the that has a true type on it. Otherwise, uh, it's going to uh, not have that type def there. And what this means is it triggers something called uh, substitution failure is not an error, um, SFINA. Um, it's a really terrible acronym. I wish they chose something different, but that's, that's what we have to go with. Um, and so basically what happens is we're in a templated context in this struct, right? We're doing a partial temp template uh, specialization. It evaluates the std enable ft. If this returns false, this std enable ft doesn't have that type type def in it. And so what happens is uh, the substitution has failed, but it's not an error, right? So that's why substitution failure is not an error. Right, so what happens is it ignores all of this. Right, it says I'm not going to pick this template. I'm not going to pick this code you wrote here because uh, the substitution failed. Right, um, and so in that way we're able to have a partial specialization that only works for arithmetic types. Right, everybody understand how that works? Great, awesome. Um, so there's a drawback to this, right? And the drawback is that there's a mutual exclusion principle that has to be adhered to whenever you specialize templates, right? So in, in my example, right, I have one for arithmetic, I have one for two things, and then I have my base template, right? The base template is just what's picked if nothing else is picked. Um, this is picked, obviously, when I pass in two things, and this is picked when I say pass int double, uh, int 64t, stuff like that, right? And so these all exist in like a happy place where they're not colliding with each other, right? They all take different places of the type space universe, right? The problem is, is what happens when you accidentally define enable if or something else that overlaps with another one, and you get a collision. And what happens is, is that uh, there are, as much as I liked doing this in my, like, because I, I define this in sold 2, right? The user can define this, but I define this in sold 2, right? And what I said is that if a user wants to do something special with their code, right, they would override this, right? And that led to problems, and I'll show you how. Um, let's say, you know, the user cracked open namespace soul stack, and they wanted to do something just for integral types, right? So I have one that handles arithmetic types, and I do both doubles and integers. But they're like, oh, no, 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 I'll just do integers, right? And so they have this to enable if, and they use the same technique, right? The same partial specialization, right? But it's an error. It's ambiguous, because it's clashing with this one, right? And this is what I mean by the, this is why we have this problem here. This is why it's, yeah, there has to be mutual exclusion. Every single uh, partial, uh, partial specialization you write, every single full specialization you write cannot be duplicated and cannot clash, right? And this presents interesting problem. Right now, obviously, right, maybe somebody shouldn't be doing the specialization for the integral types, right? And, I mean, some users did, and, you know, I had to talk to them and come to an understanding. Um, but sometimes you want to write something like this for your own code. Um, for example, somebody might have a, do, want to do some conversion with std string. Well, the problem is, is that in Sol2, I already defined this. So when somebody wants to say, oh, I want to handle string, to string in a different way, well, I already wrote this for you. So you can't do this anymore. You can't extend it anymore, right? And so this becomes a problem uh, for the implementation, right? It becomes impossible to actually hold down uh, uh, 
what happens, right? And, and just kind of as, as another example, right? Let's say I have a customization point, right? And I do the same std enable if t stuff. And I say, if it has a, has a begin and an end, then I'll treat it as like, you know, some container type and do some magic here, right? But then somebody else says, oh, well, I want to specialize this for my, you know, my vector, my, my, custom, my custom vector, right? But this is a partial template specialization too. So these two will provide an error and you won't get anywhere. Um, and this happened a lot in Sol2, right? Where I would define things to do crazy, awesome magic that everybody would love, but then somebody would be like, oh, wait, I need to crack this open for my own custom implementation, and the error would happen, and things would explode. So that was the, that's the mutual exclusion problem. There's also other problems. Um, you have to make sure that all of these specializations that you write, all of these parse specializations, they need to be visible when you use them. And what I mean by that is that uh, these templates, which you know, usually define in headers, um, need to be there every time you use them, but not only that, but it needs to be there for every single time you use them in every single CPP file, in every single library in your whole thing. Otherwise, you'll end up with what's called an one definition rule, viola one definition rule violation. Um, that's what ODR stands for, one definition rule. Um, the problem is, is that when you, uh, there, there's multiple ways that this problem is. So the first is the visibility problem, right, where you have to make sure it's always visible. Right, which means that you've tightly coupled your extension point and your class, right? If you don't want to have everything, if you don't want to have problems later down the line, um, it's also problematic uh, if you have, say, macros in these templates, or you're using like if const expert to do some compile time switching. Uh, if you're not careful, what happens is is that you can compile two versions of the same function that do different things, and as of right now, there's no compiler that will stop you from doing that. Right? What it'll say is that. You know, say you had, a, say um, you had, you you defined a special, you define you define the specialization, right? And you had a if def uh, treat strings as numbers, right? And you did some special implementation thing, and then you said otherwise hashtag else, you know, whatever else, right? You included in one translation unit with the define there. You then use it in another translation unit, and you don't have the define there. What happens is is that this name gets mangled, and this gets put in the object file, and gets compiled down to the to the same mangled name, but there's two different implementations. But what you're doing when you're using templates is you're promising to the compiler that, hey, listen, every single instantiation of this thing with the types and whatever else is exactly the same. But we're violating that, right, by having different implementations. And so what happens is the compiler will compile it all together, and then it says, well, I trust the user, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the other instantiations and throw them out the window, right? And I'm only going to keep one. And it only keeps one. And so at runtime, and so by the time your, your, your thing is done compiling, when you finally run this thing, you'll either get one implementation or the other implementation, right? And you won't know which one it is. Uh, or, I mean, you will if you know, crack open the code and you look at the assembly and stuff like that, maybe, but you won't know what it is. Um, I, it was actually a subject of a blog post, and it's, it's a lot longer and more complicated, but this happens a lot when you have these kinds of customization points, right? When they're template-based, you have a lot of ODR problems that show up, right? One of the ways that you can kind of combat this, this visibility problem is by having a customization point where you have an undefined base class. And what that means is, is that uh, if somebody writes a specialization, right, and for some reason they forgot to include that specialization while they were working in their CVP file and it, it messed up, right, well, what happens is the compiler, will, while it's compiling your code, will see that there's no specialization and it'll try to pick up this. But it's undefined. So the compiler is just going to say, hey, listen, you didn't define this uh, thing, so you're going to get a compiler error, right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't trickle down to some ODR problem later on the base implementation uh, doesn't exist, so I'll just say, hey, you don't have a base implementation. Of course, it's a problem because in, in my case, right, like, I have a base implementation, right? So I, I need to be able to handle the default case, right? So because I have to handle the default case, it's impossible for me to actually have that error exist, um, which is, you know, just kind of bad. Um, so, but this is a way that if you don't have, like, a default implementation, um, you can combat that. The other thing is you can write also a nicer version of this where you actually define it, but you static assert on it. Note that you have to use this, uh, this like trick thing, always false, where you provide the template into it. Um, it's always going to evaluate it to be false. You know, the, the colon colon value is always going to be a static context per bool, you know, value equals false. But the idea here is that you have to do this because static assert is evaluated eagerly. Um, and so even if this is a templated context, and you know, even, this, even though this is templated, um, you will always get an error if you don't mill it through a template, right? It has to be dependent. Like the, the value that comes out of here has to be dependent. Otherwise, this will get, otherwise the static assert will get eagerly evaluated and it will blow up your code uh, even when you're not calling the extension, even when you are calling the proper extension point, right? Everybody understand how that works? Cool, great. Um, 
The other drawback is this, this extra template arc, right? Like, just, who wants to write this? Like, this is ugly, this is gross. Like, what is this, like, student enable if, like, you understand it when somebody teaches it to you, right? You understand it when somebody shows it to you. My users never understood this. But right? for this, 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 for them, this is like, what the hell are you doing here? What is this black magic? And so, for them, it was always a problem, right? It was always a drawback to have to teach somebody what this Fine stuff was, right? And it's messy, right? Decal type, you can, do, you can do a specific form of Sphene called decal type, or you can do the size of uh, Sphene, or is detected. Um, and it's less ugly than enable if, but it still introduces the, the mutual exclusion principle problems, right? And if you, for somebody who's just trying to overload things for their types, right, they can very easily fall into the pit. Wait, when you give them this kind of tool, it's very easy for them to start stepping on their own toes, uh, which is, you know, again, not an elegant way of working with this thing. Um, the good news is that concepts do allow for a simpler version of customization point constraints. And so the idea is here, you can slap this uh, concept in here, container-like, and it'll get concept constrained, and it basically works exactly like a partial template specialization, right? And so this way, you don't have to do any of the ugly enable if stuff, you can remove the uh, template argument and you can just use concepts, right? Which is cleaner, right? If you're going to do this, you can only have a single argument or only have the arguments you need without the extra like Sphene argument, and then have a clean implementation, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Oh, C++ 20 makes that easier? Great. Um, oh, again, drawback is arcane knowledge, right? I, the book reports I get, uh, yes. Uh, curious yes. Uh, are these actually, oh, thank you. Are these actually partially ordered correctly and you don't have mutual exclusion problems anymore? Uh, when you say by they're partially ordered correctly, do you mean that the... Uh, so I know the concept, thank you. Concepts, <laughs> um, induce a partial ordering on functions and yes. overloads, right? Uh, do they now also in induce a partial ordering on custom or on um, template specializations? I believe they are much more strict than that um, for templates. They, 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 they do uh, basically true or false exact matching, I believe. Oh, so it's uh, just enable it. Yeah, so it's just, I believe it's just enable it, right? I might, so it doesn't solve yeah, all the way back there, Zach. Uh, no, no, that's not true. So okay, so it's not true. If you had the um, the integral constant and then you had the um, arithmetic co uh, co uh, concept, there would be uh, partial overloading for you, and that's that's part of the charm of concepts is that it does ah, that for okay. you. All right. So well, the 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 point was was that uh, no, it's not exact matching. It's uh, you get partial matching, which is what uh, Gasper had pointed partial out. Partial order. Partial ordering on this, where uh, stronger concepts match better. I believe. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's actually even better. So. That makes this even more appealing. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, so the other drawback is, uh, right, and so the other, the other drawback with the arcane knowledge is that, you know, um, typical CSS users just want to write simple code, right? Um, and this gets us pretty closer to having simpler code, but, you know, they want to write classes, they want to write functions, not so much templates, right? Templates are not exactly the most fun thing to write. Um, the other th problem is header bloat, right? And, and this is kind of like endemic to CS++ in general, but whenever you have templated uh, or, or compile time extension points, right, it becomes problematic to have to, it becomes problematic uh, to uh, work with them um, because templates themselves, right, the initial, the initial dec uh, these initial declarations, right, have to live in the header file. And maybe you'll, you'll manage to export, like, the stuff inside, but all of these have to usually live in a header, right? And that means you have to parse it over and over and over and over and over again. Now, modules are, you know, Maybe we'll help with that, but that's kind of the problem. Um, and so, you know, the, there's a lot of places where doing, you can cut down on this a lot. I had one uh, large um, company using this, and uh, so what I did to, to help them with their compile times is I provided four declarations for literally everything. Um, and they started using those instead with, with some new extension points that I'm going to show you later in the talk, and it cut their compile times down by like 50%, um, just by not having to continually parse the massive Sol2 header, right? Um, and that, and you know, obviously the, all the standard headers I had to drag in along for the ride, right? Um, which is another problem, right? The standard uh, itself doesn't define a lot of forward headers, right? So if you include functional, you take everything functional has to offer and not just the part that you want, right? Um, and again, they're saying that modules will solve this, right? That, you know, the way that it works, that by providing modular standard and other things, right, that we'll be able to get around this problem. Uh, I don't have t evidence for that in my hands. Um, I think there are more committee members that do have that evidence, but uh, not with me, unfortunately. Um, so let's, let's talk about another uh, extension point, right? That's a little bit simpler than the one that we just talked about. This is std hash, right? It employs the same like structure specialization technique, but it's actually substantially simpler. Um, and it's 
uh, very useful that it's a substantially simpler because uh, lack of the uh, sphene, um, lack of having a sphene parameter meant that you could only match this strictly on certain types, right? So I can't like do like std enable if is integral and then start like overriding stuff here, right? I can only specialize it for one thing, right? Um, and so that's kind of a benefit, right? In that you prevent people from having these mutual exclusion problems with partial, uh, uh, with partial specializations. Of course, there's a small drawback because, well, now if you have a large, if you have a number of things that all share the same interface, right, and it would make sense to have a template over it, well, you can't because you can only do it for one thing at a time, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Like, why having only one template argument here allows for this, but doesn't allow for like all the other fancy enable if stuff? Great. Um, and so, it's, it avoids, it kind of avoids the arcane knowledge because you're not working with the uh, enable if stuff. You're not working with Sphene, right? And so, in that way, it's still simpler than the last, you know, the last touch point that I was using for Sol2, right? Uh, but there's some caveats with the way std hash itself works, right? So, for example, it takes away some of the core defines, right? So, std hash is already defined for like int and strings and a bunch of other stuff, right? So, if you want to write your own hash, you can't necessarily inject that into this customization point. Now, you're lucky in that the places where hash is used is used as a trace type, and so you can substitute it out. But as a general principle, like using this as the only customization point, having only uh, Defining predefined things for a person is is not a good idea, um, and of course there's no there's no way to opt out or override those defaults, and of course you have the same visibility header contamination issues. Uh, so for example, functional it's always coming along for the ride, whether you want you know all of that other stuff to come or not. Um, and so this is a question of whether or not this is a, a good thing or a drawback, um, because the idea here is that you couldn't like just slap some concept on T and then apply it to this 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 hash right. But now somebody can write integral of hash t, right? And now you can fight with the standard, right? Or they can define a concept that's too overreaching, right? And now you can start fighting with other people's hashes. And so this is a good thing in that you are able to get the partial template specialization power back in that you can define it for a, a whole range of things. But if your concept is not on point, you've just ruined somebody else's day, right? So keep that in mind as you, you know, work with this thing. I, I, I'm gonna say overall this is a benefit, but you have to be careful. Yes. So this is more a question to the committee members. Should we like forbid this? I, I don't think Walter Brown called this out, but all right. So you can't do that. All right, so this is already banned in the standard, or going to be banned in the standard. This is scary. I don't want this. I agree with you that this is scary and that we don't want this, but that's how it works, right? That's how concepts work, right? This is this is an un, this is this is this, this is the core language rippling down into the library, and in a way that we maybe didn't call out, you know, previously, right? Uh, well, some people are saying that it was already banned, and so they already did call it out, and so this is not a problem, but this is a thing, right? Um, and so I call it the standard, not that necessarily that the standard has to be worried because the standard can just you know slap some standard ease on it and be okay, right? But <laughs> somebody wrote a, somebody wrote a, right no, but like literally somebody wrote a library that has a single template specialization, right? And if you don't if you're not careful, right, you can step all over their toes, right? Yes, Bryce, in the back. Regardless of whether or not the standard says you're not allowed to do this, you, you can still do this. So, like, yeah, so, so, so you can't stop, you just say don't. Right, so, so what he's saying is that the standard can, you know, put on all the specification that says don't do this, but you can still do it and still ruin somebody's day. Um, and so you just, again, this is like one of those things that you just have to be careful and judicious, right? Um, hopefully by getting ahead of the curve and saying this before CS20 is released, uh, maybe we'll help prevent that madness from coming. And so the other library vendor complaint is that you're opening up namespace stood, or you're opening up my namespace, right? And for them, that's problematic. And it's actually what's forced a lot of the STL developers to switch to ugly identifi identifiers for realsies, um, in that before they didn't really use like ugly identifiers everywhere, and then people started using like namespaces like stood, they started like specialized stuff, stood hash, and like putting other stuff in here that they shouldn't have, or like defining things, or like putting macros, and, and then, you know, that like blew up people, their standard libraries, and they send in bug reports, like, you broke my code. It's like, well, no, you weren't supposed to do that. And it's like, well, and so the only way out of it is that they had to actually start using ugly identifiers everywhere. I think MSVC uses one underscore capital letter because that's a reserved identifier, but uh, libc++ uses both the double underscore ugly identifiers, um, or the single, um, un the single underscore uh, with, the, with the uppercase letter. Um, and so all standard libraries have to do that. I actually had to, act, so I got accepted into writing some uh, standard library code for libstud C++, and uh, man, that really hurts. It really hurts for, like reading and writing those identifiers. It's like. <coughs> yeah, so uh, the comment was, was that, 
Yeah. It, yeah, well, it, it, yeah, so the, the comment was that this was this is not like specific to CS plus, it happened in C and that, you know, um, this is like endemic to like the C and CS plus in general. Um, and so, you know, the, the good news about this is that, you know, when you file a bug report and you have like, and you're doing stuff like this, well then like, the, you know, the compiler vendors can fire back and say, not a defect, get out of here, get off my lawn, right? You know, that stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so that's why we, you know, there's hazard rules. But there is a paper, um, it was last seen in uh, Rapperswil, Switzerland, the standards meeting there, P00665. And the whole point of that paper is that you're allowed to write these specializations, but not in namespace stood. You can write them in your own namespace, right? Which that, that prevents people from opening up other namespaces, right? Uh, we haven't gotten to look at it since, since Rapper School in 2018, um, so I think it might be pushed to CS 23. Um, but there's like some like, there's a lot of bike shedding. I was in the session that where we talked about that. Um, there's a lot of bike shedding where basically we're like, oh, we will, can we op can we boot in the top level namespace? Or is it only in this namespace associated with it, right? Do, do you have to fully qualify the name stood every time you specialize a template in the other? It's lots of stuff like that, right? But we'll figure it out eventually. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the beefier, cooler, nicer stuff. Um, template functions and a lot of the stuff. A lot of the stuff is what's going to talk is going to speak to uh, range v3. Um, all of Niebler's work with stood ranges, um, and how we define customization points in friendship, even things like abseil and other things like that, put a lot of work into how do we make extension points out of functions, right? Because remember on that last slide I showed you, the idea is that functions are a better abstraction, right? Like specializing class templates is not like fun to do, right? And again, I just showed you like this big foot gun where somebody can slap a concept on a template that previously only allowed explicit full specializations and turn them into parse specializations, right? So. A lot of people, after kind of stood hash and using that for a while, kind of started moving towards functions as a way of writing their abstractions, right? But it comes with a whole other bag of like issues and everything else. So first we're gonna talk about just plain old function overloading, right? Where you step into the namespace of somebody else's namespace, whether it's boost or the standard or whatever, and you write the function that you're supposed to. That's, that's you know, works for your types, right? Or a class or a body of types. And so usually what happens is the library author explicitly blesses and says, you're allowed to do this, right? They say, you, you, you are blessed and go forth, my child, and uh, specialize. <laughs> um, and so what happens is uh, this is actually the old way that std swap was supposed to be customizable um, and that you were supposed to just crack open the namespace stood, slip your overload in there, and then leave, right? That was a viable way to do that until the people started cracking down on it. But they have to, they can't really, they crack down on it until it's not supposed to see something you do now, but it's uh, something that's part of legacy code and you have to keep letting it work and stuff like that. So that's, why, that's one of the things that there. Um, the other, uh, the other thing we're going to do a small case study on boost serialization, right? Because boost serialization uses the same technique uh, and a bunch of other techniques to actually work with uh, these template, uh, these function overloading and template function overloading. So let's look at this boost serialization example. Um, this is actually similar to the code that uh, David, uh, that David Tinkler, who's here, um, said in his keynote, where you can define a, s you can crack open uh, namespace boost namespace serialization and then write your own serialized function. Um, the reason it takes a template class archive is because this archive can be a saving archive or a loading archive, and what they happen is that uh, depending on which type it is, it overloads how this function, how this operator works. And so, in this way, you don't have to write save and load functions separately. You can just write one and then serialize them both. Um, that's why I mean that's just a cool thing. I, that's just a really cool thing that's in uh, boost serialization, you know. Um, but then that you know you take the archive, you take you know your class, you take the you take the version, and then you serialize whatever you want, and then you close the namespace and you're done, right? And that's how this works. Um, which is pretty good, I mean, as far as it goes. Um, the problem is, again, you're, you're cracking open somebody else's namespace um, and all that, and all of, you know, you get the same complaint from the library vendors. But there's, so, and, and, and so the way that this works is both a benefit and a drawback. So for example, if these customization points are not required, right, like you include somebody's library, um, but you don't need the serialization customization points, right? Well, the idea is that you can separate these out and define them somewhere else right, in like, with like the namespace opening, right, in like a separate header or something, and it's like totally fine. Um, the problem is, is that uh, if you have this and it's like required, right, you're like, you need this like functionality in order to like use the library, period, right, then the problem is, is that uh, you have to drag in all boost serialization to go with you. Um, and if you put in a separate header, or you don't like package it tightly with the code, um, with, the, with the class of the code, right, you could end up having a problem where you, uh, use the wrong serialization function or things just stop compiling. It's actually, it'd be benign if things stopped compiling, right? Because then at least you'd have an error and a chance to fix it. Um, but those are non-benign cases, right? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about that. But before we go there, we're going to talk about the, the other way that you could do this um, with boost serialization where you create a private function. Um, and what you do is, you do, it's the same thing. Um, but, you know, inside the class, 
And so you have your in AB, but you've added this like friend class boost serialization access. And what that allows it to do is you friend this class, and so it's allowed to call serialize on your object. And what that allows it to do is basically serialize everything you need into the archive, right? The idea here is that there's a type coupling, right? It's a benefit if it's required, right? Because now you can't forget, right? And it also makes it hard for you to actually like uh, you can't like separate it out and like do something bad with it. The drawback is that you know if the compilation of boost serialization is 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 terrible for your you know your general like project, uh, well now you just drag that in in a header and it has to be part of the the, the fun, right? Um, yeah, uh, and so that's kind of the the drawback there. Now in in this case you're you're sort of lucky in that, you know, I believe there's a forward declaration of boost serialization access that you can use. Uh, yes, uh, Gasper. So I, I'm not understanding why you need to drag in boost serialization for this, because well, you're templated on some opaque archive. There's nothing there. Um, the friend class you can forward declare, because it's right, by well, name friendship. Um, So, so, so uh, the, 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 the comment was is that you don't have to drag in all the boost serialization header for this. And that's true uh, if you get the forward declaration of boost serialization access, right? You can avoid that, right? Like the, the author of the library has made it easy to like, avoid that. Um, but it's not, if you, you can imagine where instead of taking template class archive, you have separate save and loads, right? And the idea behind that is that you'd actually take the hard, like, the hard type save and the hard type load and you do different things in them, right? In that case, you, you would need to include at least that part of boost serialization, right? Um, so in this way, you can avoid the problem. You can avoid the header, uh, the header, the compilation time expansion, right? Um, and so again, this again, I'm, I'm showing this as a way to be nice, like nicer and cleaner about doing this. Um, but again, it does still introduce that kind of tight coupling, right? You have to define it on the class and all of that, right? And so that all have to um, stay tightly coupled. But it's not necessarily that bad um, because Titus Winners and the Absale team are, are very happy with with these kinds of extension point with like either using friend class or or friend function, um, because that's what they've been advocating uh, for their library. And that's actually what they ex use extensively all around. Um, yeah, and so that's basically how, that's like an overview of like function template overloading, right? Anyone have any questions or comments? All right, we're, we're making good time, great. Uh, so now we're going to get into the real beast. Ah, geez. Um, we're going to talk about argument dependent lookup. <laughs> argument dependent lookup is, Really complicated, like super complicated. Like I could probably fill a couple slides with just the rules. Right? I believe it's like a, the, the biggest lookup system in, in the standard. Um, the simple version that we're going to care about is that we rely, it relies on the namespace of arguments to add additional symbols to unqualified calls, right? There's some cases where it doesn't have to be unqualified in the template context or whatever else. But for us, we're worried about unqualified calls uh, and relying on namespaces to find the right on the namespaces of arguments to find like additional entities to use for lookup, right? Um, the primary intentional use is for generic templated code, right, to work with arbitrary types. And the other type, the other way that we use this is all the time without us realizing it is operators, right? So there's many people who have like an intuitive understanding of how like the operate have how ADL should work, um, but the finer points of it are always you know kind of crazy. Um, but the reason why ADL exists is for Calls like this, A equals B, right? You need to find the right operator, right? And so you look in the friend, you look in the friend inside the class, you look in the general namespace, you percolate up to find to find, you, you know, match on, you, you get all the symbols, and then you perform overload resolution, right? And you, you do all, all that stuff. Um, so we have two case studies for how ADL is supposed to work. Um, stood swap, which is the wrong way to do it, um, and stood ranges or range v3, which is the right way to do it. Let's dig in. We're going to dig into swap first. Swap works in that you call swap, you know, two arguments. And invokes ADL because the call name is unqualified, right? And that's what you want to happen. Um, the problem with this is that it looks in the namespaces of A and B, as well as in the current scope, but it doesn't it doesn't consider the core specialization, right? That's in std swap, right? Because you didn't qualify it, right? And if you're not in namespace std or have arguments that come from namespace std, it's not going to find the swap in namespace std, right? So that's kind of a bug, right? The other problem, the other way you can write this is, of course, you fully qualify. Like you know, everybody says you fully qualify. Don't use using namespace, right? So you, you're you're a good programmer. You you listen to the wisdom and you stood swap, right? Because that's what you're supposed to do, right? The problem is this only looks at namespace standard because you qualified the call, right? You said stood swap, so it's you said listen. I don't care about all the other swaps out there. I'm looking for stood swap, and that's the only one I want, right? And so the proper way to do this is to do this, this little two step here, 
this using std swap and then call swap, right? So get the, the base swap, the base implementation, and then call swap unqualified so that it collects all the other swaps that are related to the arguments and in the current scope and blah, 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 right? And then we use overload resolution to figure out, you know, with A and B to figure out which one we should be calling, call it, and we go through, right? Eric and Eber spent a lot of time on this. Uh, yes, Gasper. It gets worse because you might want to prefer the member version instead of the free function one. Right, so Gasper's comment was it gets worse because there's more ways to write, you can write swap. But basically, um, there's a member version, right? There's A dot swap B, right? Because we also said that that was okay in, C++, in the old C++ versions and said that, you know, we, we were supposed to call that. Um, that was how you're supposed to write it. Um, and so there's three different ways you're supposed to call swap. And so this is, this is the proper way as far as, you know, like uh, most of us are concerned. Um, and that std swap, I believe now the implementation of std swap will check if there's a member swap, call it for you, call A dot, a dot swap B, um, or it will look for the free function one and then, you know, you get, you get all those different ones. Um, but that's kind of how it works right now. But it's a failure, right? Having to have somebody write this every time they want to use a generic algorithm, whether it's swap or something else, is a failure. Right? And he wrote, Eric Neal wrote about this back in October 2014 when he was really undertaking ranges. Right? And he was really trying to find the best customization. Like, how do I let people customize ranges so that it does the right thing for their containers or their views or their, their ranges, right? And so he said that the, 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 the two-step was a failure, right? So either you just blindly vomit out using std swap swap, right? Because that's what you were told to do because you're a good programmer. Or you completely understand how two-phase name lookup works in templated context, and then you know you 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 divine that 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 what you're supposed to be doing in, in those situations, right? Neither of those are a good prospect. So this is how uh, Eric decided to tackle this problem, right? You call the actual swap. You call the actual swap with, with a qualified call, namespace swap, right, with the arguments. And what it does is it does the ADL for you. Right? It includes the base implementation and then goes off and, you know, and because it's an unqualified call, it will go off and collect all the overloads that are supposed to matter and then do overload resolution and resolution and, and figure it out and call the right one for you, right? And so in this way, he thought that, well, now we have the wisdom that you always call my namespace swap and do the right thing, but we'll do the ADL under the hood for you, right? And so this is how this kind of works, right? If we, if we were implementing the standard, right? Now, obviously, this is not really a real standard implementation because, one, I'm not, my, my identifiers aren't ugly. Uh, you know, um, and you know, obviously there's, there's, you know, there's a lack of, uh, of irreadability, of, uh, you know, unreadability here to refer to qualify as a standard implementation. Anyway, um, we write this struct, right, this, 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 this object, right, and the idea here is that we have a callable operator on it that takes, you know, the arguments that we want. We're using the concepts here, swappable, swappable of A, swappable of B. Um, and what happens is we just call swap, right? Now, you may be wondering, like, well, hold on, what about using std whatever, right? Well, our base swap, our detail swap, is already in scope, right? So we can just do the unqualified call and we'll already start matching with this, right? And that's, that's why there's no, like, using std blah right here, right? Everybody understand that? Okay. Um, and so this is, the this, is the this is the insides, right? You define this, this object, right? You set up the, you know, your, con your beautiful const no except void, you know, blah, blah, or maybe even decal type auto, whatever you want, uh, operator for this, and you call it. And, you know, if there's no thing, if nothing that's found right, you get your default implementation as long as it's swappable. Um, otherwise, you know, you get an error or something else happens, right? And so in C++ 17, this land, you know, you inline const disper, const auto swap, define the function object, right, and you're, you're, you're ready to go. Um, if you're working with older standards, what you do is you have to create a static constexpr, uh, static constexpr version of the, uh, of the type, define it, and then just kind of have it sit out, you know, out in the open, right? Everybody understands how this, the idea behind this, how this works? This is, this is like the old Crofty implementation. Please just do this. Like, this, is, this is not cool. This is, this is cool. Do this. Yeah, this is, the, this, the, so, uh, yeah, so, so the reason you do this is because uh, you run into ODR problems, um, one definition rule problems, in that uh, if you were to just like drop like a, a swap function like in the namespace, right? Weak symbol convention. It's precisely the weak symbol problem. Right. Symbol yeah, so the, like as the audience uh, commented, this is a weak symbol problem, right? But the reason you do it like this is to, is to avoid that problem, right? So that you have a, a single symbol, um, no ODR problems, any of that, right? Um, and that's, this is, to get around this problem, this is one of the explicit reasons why the inline variables were introduced in C++ 17, right? So please just, if you're using it, just please just write this. Like, nobody wants to read this, okay? Um, 
And so for ADL, right, you can do things like just define a friend free function that takes that takes your two types and just swaps them, right? And it, it'll find it, right? And it's very simple, right? Like I can put like DLL export blah blah blah, right, on top of this function, right, and export it, right? It's very simple, right? There's no templates in the way, right? It's it's, it's exactly what I need, right? It's a, it's an abstraction I understand, right? Like there, there's an extra friend thing here, right? But like for the most part, like this is what I want to write. Right? This is this is the implement. This is the golden standard, right? This is what I want to write. Um, and so you may be wondering, like, why is it a friend function? Well, friend functions contain a few encapsulation benefits that help avoid name collision, right? So if you define a friend function, it is effectively a free function. But if somebody were to go into the, somebody were to say colon colon swap and try to call it with two things, it would not work here, right? Because it doesn't exist in the namespace, right? And so this way, this gives you more encapsulation power, right? And so the only way this is found is by ADL, right? Does everybody understand that, right? So we're, we're adding a layer of protection, right? There's no way to call this, there's no way, there's no way to accidentally call this in the, in the namespace, right? Like if you define a free function swap. But if you, by defining it as a friend, you provide additional encapsulation that prevents people from accidentally calling it the wrong way, right? The only way you can get it is through ADL, right? And so this is a very good way to make, make sure that you only get this called by the ADL extension point, right? Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Uh, okay, so so uh, the comment was with that you know you can write this implementation, you can define it and everything inside the class. You can then take this de this declaration, not the full definition, but this declaration out of this class, stick it in the namespace next to this thing, and it will. And as long as it's a declaration, it will refer to this function, right? So you don't have to actually define it twice. You can just, if you want it to be available from colon colon swap, you can pull out the declaration and stick it here, right? And that'll make it visible, right? Yeah, it's, it's just a visibility, like the comment was that it's just a visibility thing, right? And that's, that's, that's really good information, right? Everybody follow that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a subtle thing, but it's a, you know, if you want, like, you know, to be able to type it normally. Yes. Oh, yes. So it's best if people don't do that trick to make those things visible. Well, hold on. It's best if people don't do that. Um, the, the nice thing about hidden member friends like that uh, is that they don't, participate in overload resolution unless the type being used to pick them is exactly the one you want. Uh, like you were saying, you're going to be picked up by ADL uh, on, on one of these types. And, and the nice thing about that is if you ever write a left shift uh, operation on something that the compiler doesn't know about, it tells you about every left shift it's ever heard of. And you get the spew that you can't understand, right? And it's all about the stream operator usually. Uh, this, similar things happen with swap. So uh, increasingly, um, the, the, the desire in the committee is to standardize this hidden uh, member friends um, idiom as the way we, we write uh, things like uh, outstream operations, swap, and stuff like that, so that we don't get that huge spew of things. Uh, and when you redeclare this outside for visibility purposes, you get back into the giant error spew. Just yeah. for so, so the comment was with that from the, the previous technique no, of I've, taking I've the declaration the and putting it on the outside. Um, uh, will result in uh, a gross amount of template spew um, in your errors and everything else. So you really just want to do this, and the committee and other people are very going in pretty hard on just having this, right? And I think even Absale uh, works like this, which we will see uh, in a second. Um, so this is actually a quick case study of Absale, um, where the way you hash values is you call Absale hash value, and it's this friend function on the class, right? And so the idea here is that you can kind of completely avoid uh, having to deal with, you know, cramming a bunch of uh, functions in your, uh, free functions in your namespace or having to define it as, uh, uh, even having to define it as a member function, you can just find this, this friend free-like function inside the class, right? And so the good thing about this is that when you do this, it's very hard to forget, like, where you define this, right? You can't, like, define in a separate header and be like, oh, I forgot to include it, right? Um, it's coupled with the class, right? And so this is a very tight coupling that keeps things, like, very, very nice. Of course, again, you run into the, you may run into the header problem if, you know, the, 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 extension point isn't very nicely designed, but, you know, with modules coming and everything else, right, that might be less and less of a concern. And now that more people are aware of, like, comp compilation times being a problem, you know, more and more people are offering ways to get out of that problem. But, yeah, so this is how uh, Absale uses friend functions for their purpose, right? Very similar to the last one. Um, this is just how they write their, their, their hashers. Um, and so, again, another, another library that's kind of gone in on this. Um, uh, another comment, yes. Just 
I think it's pretty dangerous. I'll repeat the question. So the question was, uh, uh, does this, uh, does that hidden member friend idiom uh, only apply to the type you put it on? And yes, that's that's the point. So it, it reduces the set of uh, uh, overloads uh, that are under consideration when you uh, call that function with that name, uh, if it's truly a hidden member friend. So you, you're just relying on name injection from declaring a friend. Um, and you don't have the explicit visibility of pulling it out afterwards with another declaration or before. I yeah. in the context of namespaces and not classes. So this is, in your, in your phrasing here, it's ADL based on classes. That's a good thing. I'm, I'm in favor. I just didn't realize that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, no, yeah, well, it's not terminal. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, again, more and more people are kind of going with the friend, with the friend ADL uh, free function classes. Um, but yeah, and again, you can you can see it's also subtly different from the boost serialization. Uh, it's subtly different from I guess the the boost serialization um, uh, way of extending things in that you don't have to friend a specific class and then write like a private member function, right? You just have to write this this kind of public facing function. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, again, the benefit is it's just a function, right? It's very easy to read. Very like this is easy, right? I can I know I can teach some of this. They understand it, right? Pretty fairly quickly, right? I, they can write this. They can export into a DLL, right? It's very simple, right? This is again a benefit. Um, problems, problems with this, 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 this uh, ADL, ADL and overloading in general. Um, the base implementation, right? So we define swap, right? And as you see here, we had to specifically use concepts, right, to make sure that this implementation was constrained. And we had to make sure that our base implementation was also constrained. Similarly, the reason we do this is because if we don't do this, what happens is we have overloading catch alls where somebody defines a function and it matches everything or matches things it's not supposed to and you call the wrong one and if you're lucky you'll call the wrong one you'll get an error because it doesn't work with the base implementation that they defined or it works but does the wrong thing or does the non-performant thing or you know that kind of issue and you get an issue and so that's why you always have to put those concepts on there um, and so you know users may not properly you know constrain their overloads right um, this is more and so this is not necessarily an experts problem this is more of like uh, a user's problem, and I, you know, and and this is actually one of the reasons why, because I proposed this 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 function this this type for the standard, right? And the first the, the second meeting I proposed this this out pointer p eleven thirty two, I was told to go out and make a and do a full survey of the industry of extension points and how they work, right? Because a lot of them were pushing to maybe have some kind of ADL that worked on this, right? So that you would call out pointer, it work like some kind of like magical ADL. Um, and then call your version of outpointer that would do the abstraction that this thing was supposed to do, right? Uh, the problem with that is specifically right here. Um, args, you know, ref ref, dot dot dot, args. That is a forwarding variadic, uh, those are forwarding variadic arguments. And the problem with that is that they will accept everything. They're basically a black hole and they will consume literally every other overload that comes along, right? Because this thing, and you know, we could fight this, right? We can constrain, we can try to put some barriers around the black hole here, right? We could, we could have some, you know, add some sphene to this, right? Add some, uh, some trailing return types, you know, a whole bunch of different things that we can do to constrain this thing, right? But it's very difficult to, to get overload sets right when you have to deal with things like this, right? So you have to be careful about where you pick your ADL, because if your ADL uh, needs to work with something that takes any number of arguments, you could be in for, for a real bad time. And so again, these are some of the ways that you can stop a, a, a function from being completely unconstrained, right? So for example, this is the decal type sphene that I was talking about earlier, where if you have a trailing return type, or, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be auto, my bad. Um, but if you have a trailing return type, uh, whatever goes in here works as a way of uh, acting as a sphene for the function, right? Um, similarly, if you just use concepts, that acts as enough of a kind of sphene and stops the, uh, you know, the snowballing of, of overload resolution. And so there's, and there, there's other ways you could do this, right? But you have to be careful, right? You have to be the one to constrain your, your function calls, right? And so, but, you know, most people are like, ah, everybody will properly constrain their function, right? Who's going who's gonna, to, you know, just write some overload that's templated that just takes anything? Like, you don't, you don't, write, you don't write code like that. Yeah, uh, people do. Um, they do. Uh, as part of my promise for uh, working on this and getting it proposed to the standard, um, I went and implemented like all of these extension points. Um, and AD, when I had the, A, the ADL ones, um, this one came up really, this one came up in that 
people don't always use concrete types. They don't always, you know, not everybody's an expert. Um, and they certainly won't constrain their function because what the hell is Sphene in the first place, right? Remember that we're, we, we were trying to get away from teaching people Sphene and like how to constrain things properly. And so people will write functions that are not constrained properly and not Sphene because you know, we're trying to get them away from that expert level stuff, right? So of course somebody's going to write a two string function because why wouldn't you? And you're gonna template it because why would you wanna write six different two string functions for your library? So somebody writes a two string function and then I'm trying to be you know, clever and use like an ADL extension pointer like for two string, right? So I test like, oh, is it like on a member? Oh, is it a free function that takes the type? Oh, is it this, is it that, right? And so I'm doing all these tests and being like clever and like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do perfect ADL, right? It's gonna be great, it's gonna work with everybody's stuff. And then this, this library, TGUI, just shows up and says, hey, I'm gonna write a two string function. I'm not gonna constrain it. It's gonna have a bad implementation that you know, only works with the OStream operator. It's not gonna try to call a member function. It's not gonna try to do any of this stuff. And it broke my users. Um, so the world is not full of only concrete types. The world is not full of people who uh, will like look at a template and get scared. They'll say like, ooh, template, ooh, way to reduce code duplication. And they'll just write a template. And it'll fight with all of your other stuff, right? So you have to be careful. Um, you really do have to be careful. And so it's, it's a bit of, oh, yes. I mean, I'm not familiar with this specific, specific example, so I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, but it, this doesn't look like me like it's even wrong. Because if you have your own namespace, and toString is not a ex specifically designated extension point. Right. Right? So you can totally say, like, I will implement this for all my types. I don't have to constrain it. It's in my namespace. It's my function. I don't have to care about anyone else. Right. And, and that makes sense. But the problem is that somebody was passing uh, a type to my library, and ADL picked it up in their namespace and pulled it out, and that's why I got the problem, right? But the, the point of the example here was not necessarily that it, it's a, it, wasn't a names, it wasn't a specifically designated as an extension point, right? It's the idea that there is a, oh. <laughs> there, there, there's the idea that not everybody is going to properly constrain everything, right? So, yeah, so Gasper, right. you said, well, it's in my namespace, it's my function, but ADL kind of makes it so that that's not true. Like, like it's in your namespace, but that it, it's not necessarily encapsulated because it can be found by ADL. So it's not really your function. Sure, but if it's not a designated extension point. All right, I think I should pass this, yeah. given past yeah. experience. All right. Yeah, so uh, again, the, the, the conversation, the comment was that, you know, um, two string in this case, like, isn't like a designated extension point, right? So it should be safe to write your own two string, right? But my, my point here wasn't necessarily that, you know, I, my point here was that I was trying to do things with ADL to be clever and to do more with what the user had provided me, right? And I did not anticipate that I would run into somebody else's, like, overload, like, in their, in their own namespace, right? Like, again, like, they wrote their own two string in their own namespace, right? Normally, ADL shouldn't be able to find that, right? Now, of course, I'm in Sol2 mode, so I'm like, why didn't you properly constrain it? Where's your, your, your decal type you know, returns and all that, and your Sphene and all that, right? But they don't have to write that, right? They really don't. Um, and so this is why you have to be careful about relying on ADL extension points, right? Because somebody can write a something in their own namespace, and it's completely benign. All their code compiles, some user uses Library A with library B, library B A is trying to do something clever with ADL and it explodes, right? Library A being Sol2 in this case, or Sol3, the, the new version I'm working on. Um, and so this comes like question. It's, it's a little bit questionable, right? That, that, that this is the, the extension point that like Niebler and everybody else has kind of gone ham in on, right? Now, we're a little bit lucky in that the begin end and all the stuff that Niebler's defining for ranges v3 has been designated to be extension points for a while now, right? So it's not like it's not like it's not like the two-string case where like where it's going to kick you out of left field and you have no idea that it was coming, right? Um, but there there are still some other like issues with the the ADL um, um, on way of doing things, right? And, and not necessarily issues, but like different design trade-offs. So for example, the way Nebloids are defined or, or Eric Niebloids extensions is that there's no way to call like the base implementation, right? The base implementation exists in some detail namespace that you're not supposed to touch, right? And so if this were to ship with the standard library, it'd be di different detail namespace everywhere, right? And you couldn't access it, right? So if the base implementation has some kind of functionality that you wanted, well, that's just too bad, right? You're always going to, the only way you can call this is with std, you know, begin, std end, std swap, whatever, and you can never touch the, the default base implementation in the Nebloid world, right? Now, that's intentional, right? In, 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 in the Nebloid world, in the standard, right? We don't want people to be touching, you don't want people to, because that was a bug, right? When you called just to swap, that was a bug, right? It would do, you know, maybe the, the move construct, the, the, the move assign, you know, 
move, uh, the move construct, move, the, the construct, move assign, move assign, destroy the last one, return, return the, the, the new, uh, retur and, destroy la and destroy the temporary, right? But that's like an inefficient, that's like an infinite base implementation, right? You don't want to access that, you know, on purpose, right? So there, there's, it's just that the idea that you can call, you can catch things that you didn't intend, right? And uh, when it comes to ADL, there's also other like surprises that are not necessarily related to catching functions outside of your namespace, but also with just your own extension points. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the ADL extension points that I am actually going to ship, despite all the horrible things I just said about ADL, I'm going to ship ADL extension points. Yay. Um, I have these, these three like functions, right? Stack, get, stack, check, stack, push, right? And I map them to these alternatively named extension points, right? So, so Lua get, so Lua check, so Lua push, right? And this is the way you kind of work with them, right? You define one of these functions. Um, yeah, and so they they look a little bit verbose, but that's because I, you know, opted to show you the full namespace and everything. But we're going to talk about, like, how these work, right, and some of the problems that can come along with them. Um, so the way we implement this is that we have a type trait that says, can I call solo a push or solo a check or solo whatever with the types, right? And so we use decl type here, and then we use, you know, decl val and static cath lua state null pointer, right? We just so that we have strongly typed arguments, and then we pass them all in and see if it works. Um, then we have this inline context per bool that says, you know, basically for the arguments you gave me, uh, is this the right thing, right? And we use this, this is detected v thing, um, which is a, a idiom for uh, basically passing in a test, uh, a test meta function plus some arguments to that's what's going to that function. Um, basically that performs the, that gives you the yes or no whether or not it's true. Um, so this is the test function, this is the is detected being, and we're passing it the test function and we're passing it the arguments that come from elsewhere. And those arguments are like this, right? So this is the, this is the implementation of the sole Lua push function, right? So we say, if const expur, can I call this function? Yes. All right, I'm going to call the function. Otherwise, do the internals, right? So we have the, the branch for the user's extension point and then the branch for ours, right? Which is just the default implementation, right? So the good news about this is that, right, this doesn't run to the same mutual exclusion problem because we check your, uh, uh, we check your, um, your extension point first, right? So we get an ordering here, right? Your extension point always takes priority over whatever default internals I have, right? And you're not defining it in the same way, you're not defining it in a, in a struct, right, and fighting with me, right? There's no reason to, uh, sorry, there's no reason to fight with me. Um, so your stuff always goes first, and if not, then it picks up my stuff, right? And you, you may be wondering, like, why do we have these, uh, uh, why do we have these, 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 uh, these type tags, these sole types, blah, these sole types, blah, the sole type, like, it's a lot of spam, right? Like, why in the world would you have it, right? That makes your API a lot more verbose. Well, as it turns out, uh, there are some problems with ADL in general, and just function, well, not just ADL, but function overloading in general, right? I define solo a push, this is before I had type tags, right? So this is an earlier version of sole2. I define solo a push for the state and some any old void pointer, right? I just want to just work with any old void pointer, right? Because I want to do something cool with it. I have this unrelated struct here. I call the extension point, right? I say soul stack push. I take some unrelated pointer, right? And pass it in. This gets called, right? Because any pointer can convert to a void star pointer. So this is a valid extension point, right? So in my previous, right? And so what happens is, is that this says, can I call that function with, the, with you know, this type and these arguments, right? And it says, yes, you totally can. And so I'll pass it on, right? And even though you didn't want this, even though you never expected this to happen, it happened, right? And this is the problem with function overloading in general, right? There's base conversions, there's, there's all sorts of things that happen, right? So overload resolution, base conversion, right? Like all these kinds of things that can just completely destroy your overload resolution set, right? And make it very difficult for you to figure out which one you're supposed to be calling, right? So now I still actually ship this, and you can still write this, and I please don't. Um, but I don't actually, so in my documentation, I don't actually show this. Um, and what I show is, uh, all of these um, with the type tags. But there's some, there might be some use case, right, where you define this to take a reference to like some base class, right, and then you define a bunch of derived classes, and you really don't want to write, you know, a bunch of extension points for the derived classes, the base class is enough, right? So you, want, you would want this to kind of like work out, right? But, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, but please don't, please don't write those, and please don't file bug reports after you've written those, you asked for it. Um, 
But yeah, um, so there are drawbacks with, with how that works, right? So you have to be careful about conversions. You have to be careful about overload ranking and all the other stuff that comes along with the, with the problems, right? And so this is why ADL overloads are also problematic, right? Somebody can define a swap that takes anything um, or don't properly constrain it, right? And it'll just beat up everything else, right? Um, or they'll write a function that should, takes more than it should and just beats everything else up. And that's just how it works, right? And so you have to do, you have to use type tags or some other ways of kind of preventing that from happening. OK, uh, so now we're going to get to the nicer stuff, right? The stuff that doesn't have to do with the compiler, right? That's mandated by the author, right? Trace types, right? Um, no ADL here, um, I mean, unless you ask for it. Um, all that stuff, right? It's, it's, it's going be, to be nice. So trace types, right? There's a bunch of them, right? Basic string, basic O stream, std vector, std map, you know, stuff in GLM, even Nolman JSONs uh, is not actually just a concrete type. It's just like massively templated type on a map type array type, allocator, serializer, and all those stuff. Treats, of course, have got a bad reputation, thanks to basic string, because, uh, I mean, just look at that. There's a bunch of static functions for comparison, for moving characters, for copying, for comparison, for length, for fine, two car type. What, why do we even have two car type, right? EOF, like, why, why does the string care about EOF, right? There's all these things on this traits type that give it a really bad name, right? Implementing one of these yourself is like an exercise in like tedium and nightmare. It, there's no real reason you want to do this, right? It, it, and it was put on things that had no business having it, right? We, we stuck it on IO streams, we stuck it on this, we stuck it on that. I didn't belong there at all, but we did it anyway, right? And so traits have a really bad reputation, right? Now, it's not all bad, right? Traits have had successful iterations. For example, std map and std on order map, right? Being able to customize the hash, being able to customize the predicate was wildly successful because like I showed up with the std hash before, right? You may want to not use the base implementation. So you want to be able to pass your own hash in. You want to pass your own predicate in. You want to be able to, you know, of course, you know, keys, values, and all that other stuff, right? Also, Nolman JSON is a templated type, you know, with semi-sensible defaults, right? But you could change the template parameters and get a new JSON type, and that's the one you're working with, right? So you have one that you, so, for example, I want a JSON, but with a better serializer, right? Because right now, what JSON has, it has an ADL serializer, and what it does is it default constructs the type, passes it in, you're supposed to fill it in, and then, you know, you, the function's over, which is like a really bad way of constructing our, uh, structuring objects. I mean, it works for like your default types, right? But it's a really bad way of working with more types than that, right? So you can change the serializer, or maybe you don't like the hash map, right? The hash map, you know, or the map that they have is not doing it for you, right? So you say, I'm going to put in the SPP sparse hash map, right? Which is a enhanced implementation of Google's hash map, right? All these things you can do, right? Because you have these traits, right? You're able to, and, and, and the idea is that this follows Chandler's C++ principle, and that you can, you get pretty good performance. You get good defaults, sensible defaults, pretty good performance by default. But at the end of the day, you can take a fork and shove it under that hood and pry the thing open and say, all right, I'm going to change this. I'm going to swap out that. I'm going to do this. And you get the performance you need. You get the performance you want. And so traits types have a lot of benefits, right? In that there's a lot of area for customizability, right? And that makes it nice. Here's some drawbacks. We had to introduce a whole new suite of types into the standard called PMR, everything under the PMR namespace. PMR allocator, PMR string, PMR vector, because every time you change the allocator, every time you change the car traits, every time you change this or that, you change the type, which means you can't pass the same function anymore, right? Unless somebody explicitly programs in a conversion from this other string type but with a different allocator to this string type with the, with the different allocator, right? You don't get that interoperability anymore. All that gets tossed out the window, right? So too much customizability is a problem, and the ABI is brittle, right? You change an allocator, well, you can't call that thing in the DLL anymore because it's not the same, right? And there's also other problems like default template parameters, right? If you actually change like the, the name of a default template parameter, right, it mangles differently on like all the compilers, right? So this is actually why we can't ship like a better allocator model by default in your like vector and everything, because if we change the default type, we will literally wipe out all the ABI compatibility, right? So that's, this is problematic, right? Trace types are good for localized like instances, right? But it's not good when you try to like spread it everywhere, right? So which one do we use, right? Again, I went with the the ADL stuff in Sol three. Niebler went with when Range V three went with his special customization ADL points that use the same name, so that you couldn't get to the base implementation, right? There's traits in Nolman JSON, and you know obviously there's you know the callbacks in IO stream stuff. But we're not gonna. I'm going to talk about those. Um, <laughs> but it really, it, it depends. It depends on your domain. It depends on what you're doing, right? Each scenario has benefits and drawbacks. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a little bit of guidance on each of those, right? So structuralization, it's really good for precise matching, except in the concepts world, right? Where it takes all that and toss it out the window because of the concepts. But 
uh, this is actually the implementation I use internally for Sol 3. Right when you hit the default implementation, I hit a struct that has templated on T, and then I do a bunch of stuff. Right. Um, the other thing I also did for that is that um, instead of having multiple different uh, sphenate out or concepted out uh, partial templates, what I did actually is I have just one template, and it's just what's like this mess of just if constant spur. Right. It's like it's like 400 lines of just if constant spur this type, if constant spur that type, if constant spur that type. And you might think that's crazy, but it actually compiles a lot faster than like actually doing sphenate and checking all and make sure that all the structs are mutually exclusive because before I had like 20, 30 of these like struct specializations, right? And it was really eating compile time. Um, I wrote a blog post about like how much I saved the compile time and basically it came a lot from using, from getting rid of std enable if, getting rid of like overload resolution on templates and using more if const expert internally once the type was figured out. Um, but yeah, so template matching is very precise except if you use concepts. Um, it's less flexible than overload resolution. Um, and you know, obviously you have to define, you know, a thing for a base class, you have to do it for the derived class, the derived class of that, blah, blah, blah. But the idea is that, you know, it's good for internal details, right? I use a lot for internal details because it's very easy to manage, right? And the good thing about this is that I can still add that extra little template parameter and do some Sphene stuff if there's something that, say, the base if const expert chain can't handle, right? So this is very good for internal details, um, and it helps you precisely match things, right? ADL. ADL is really good for this like stateless consistency, right? You have a sprawling user base. You have a sprawling application that covers many different places, right? You can't afford to have a traits type that everybody might want to flip up and start changing things and change the type, and well, now, they, now none, none of the stuff talks to each other anymore, right? The ADL extension points are very good in that it works very well in a, in a type, it, it works very well in, in, a, in a situation where, there's, where like type richness isn't all that big of a deal. Um, and so it's very easy to be able to use ADL here, use ADL over there, use ADL all the way over here, right? And so have it all kind of be unrelated and still work together, right? Um, I personally believe it's a little bit better for the library developer space um, and for providing users extension points. Um, of course, you have to, I took the route of adding type tags to make sure I didn't like step on people or call overloads didn't uh, call overloads didn't uh, break at people. Um, but that was kind of the decision I kind of made in the end. Um, but yes, and the. The other thing is that uh, the guidance is that you should probably use the, the Nibloid style if the user uh, is not going to kind of like step on your toes or write bad you know, overloads for your bad, bad versions of begin and end um, and things like that. Um, and when you also want to make it sure that these Nibloids can be passed to high order functions, right? So the, the benefit of this being a function object or a Nibloid is that you can pass it to something like std transform or whatever, right? And it'll do what it's, what it's supposed to do, right? Um, the problem with regular functions is that you know they're notoriously difficult to work with in C++, right? So the Nibloids space is very good if you want to work with higher order functions and things like that, right? But you want to use this sol three separate names function style kind of thing, right? If you want to make it so that the user can still call the default behavior in a well-defined way, right? You know you don't want you don't want like your you don't want your special things stored in some detail namespace that nobody can access, right? You want to be able to access the base implementation and do something useful. Uh, yes, question. I really like the separate name function style, not for the access to the, uh, base. you know, base implementation. It's more that you're literally saying my name will not conflict with other people's use of this name because you're effectively right. injecting your names into their namespace if they want to use your, your right. Uh, so, so yeah, to, to go off that comment, um, one of the the issues with Nibloids is that they use the same name as the essential what you're supposed to write. So. What it means is that no matter how hard you try, you could constrain all day, right? At some point, there is a swap function in that hierarchy of swap calls that is going to be competing with your call, right? And so the idea of having a separate named function is that you get this space, and it's entirely your space. I will never define an int for you. I'll never define an int specialization. I'll never define a std string specialization. I'll never have to do any of that, right? It's entirely your space. So you can do whatever you want with it, right? You can create some crazy ADL overloading scheme if you want to. You can do struct matching after you catch all that, right? It's your space, right? And so that's a very, that's a very liberating thing as a library developer, right? Not having to fight with your users, right? To say like, listen, this is your, that's your lawn, that's your house, or it's fine to don't, like I'll invite you over for beers just for maybe a couple times, but please don't, right? Like you over there, it's your space. Um, and so that's like one of the reasons why having separately named functions, right? And I, I kind of would think that maybe in, in the future of the standard, right, we might define customization points that are separated out like this, right? Because what it does is it means that the implementers can do whatever they want in their space, right? But you have a nice well-defined space out there that you can put all your stuff in, right? 
And now traits, right? So the last thing is traits, obviously. Um, and this is for when the user wants to have more control over the system. And you know, they don't really have to like interrupt with existing code, right? They're just like, I got to work with like my space. Like, this is my local area, right? Like, I'm going to put the most optimized hash map for this problem. Right? Everywhere else can use the basic string, but I'm going to have like the, the great string right here. Like, so I'm going to have you know, my, my namespace great string. It's going to be right here, and this is going to be mine, right? And that's, that's what this is good at, right? And so it's very good for highly tailored needs, right? You can tailor this thing to do exactly what you want, right? And so in that way, it's very good. But you have to be careful in like shipping these things all over the place because, well, then you have problems of people talking to each other, right? Too many policies, too many traits, right? How do I get my case insensitive string to talk with your regular string, right? Like there's no conversion function or anything, right? So that's, that's a bit of a problematic. Uh, yes? One comment about tailoring traits is I'm not quite the same kind of traits as these traits. The way I understand iterator traits, as opposed to these traits, these traits right. are a customization point for, uh, say, basic string or unordered map or something where you want to say this works differently. Yes. Whereas for iterator traits, and in our company we use like enum traits, where you want to uh, say additional information about this type. Right, right. So, so, so the comment was that though so I use the word traits here and I use it liberally. Um, there are different other kinds of traits in the C++ standard, right? Like iterator traits and other things like that where you, or allocator traits is another one, where you can put in a T and it just gives you additional information. Um, sometimes they also do act as customization points. Uh, there's also pointer traits and there's like a to address that's like a customization point there. But again, those are like explicitly blessed customization points, right? So traits is kind of an overloaded term, so just, you know, you have to be careful about it. Um, yeah, uh, so that's actually the full talk. Um, so I actually want to talk about some future talks. There's actually like, there were like 300 slides in this thing, um, and I had to cut it down a lot. Um, <laughs> because I also talked about like unassisted runtime, deal, like hooking, hot reloading, versioning, like debug gap placements. Like there's a whole stuff that we could talk about, like real like runtime extension, like not like compile time, like the ADL stuff, like library space, like actual like I have a executable. How do I extend this executable, right? And that's this stuff, right? But that's a futures talk. Um, there's also another future talk. Where uh, you know the future of customization points, CS23 customization point functions. That's not actually the name of the paper, but it's Matt Calabrese's P1292, and he basically defines a bunch of really cool stuff that will like solve like half of the problems that you have seen on these slides. So you know it would be really cool if that talk was there, Matt. Please, hey Matt, do the talk. <clears throat> anyway, uh, thank you all for being here, and I want to thank a couple people. Um, Eric Fasselier and Titus Winters are the ones who challenged me to to actually research extension points for this paper, P1132 stood out pointer, and uh, that actually spawned this whole talk and like all the research I did. Um, Isabella Muerta actually, um, because I was thinking about using, I actually was seriously thinking about using a custom, uh, ADL customization point for outpointer, right? The one that had all those variadic arguments. And then she was like, listen, tell them ADL, ADL customization point is insane, right? And she was right because like all those variadic arguments would catch on things that it wasn't supposed to, right? Um, and I also want to thank the Lounge C++ and Include C++ um, for just being a place where I could talk and bounce ideas off of and being warm and friendly and welcoming and all that stuff. Um, all right, uh, so this is where you can find me, all these places. I'm actually called, I'm, ac I'm really excited because I got linkedin.com slash in slash the PhD and that actually links to me. That's great. Um, there's also a Patreon, I have my blog and Twitter, you could bother me. Um, I write a bunch of standardization papers, so I actually do love feedback and I do respond and all that stuff. So yeah, um, any, uh, any questions? Um, yeah, so there's more of a comment. So uh, in our production uh, code base, Thrust, we recently switched to using separately named functions of a similar style, style to what you're using in Sol3. And uh, it solved a, a, a ton of issues for us. We had some unpleasantness in how our ADL dispatch worked, um, where you could potentially end up like recursively calling um, uh, some of the dispatch points and moving to separately named functions, yeah. like solved that. And like one of the bigger things that it solved was it just made it like a lot less confusing to users because you no longer had like this one name that meant very somewhat different things. Um, so I, I think it's just a much saner approach. Um, yeah. I, I, I wish we had more time and would have been able to explore uh, uh, if it would have been a good option for something like uh, uh, ranges. Yeah. Um, but yeah, plus one. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Any other questions, comments? Uh uh, oh, could you near? pass that? Yeah, so you highlighted the benefits of having function objects. Yes. And then 
at the same time, why didn't you use function objects that dispatch to functions that have a different name yes. instead of having itself be a function? Like yeah, well, so the benefits of being a function are that you can pass to higher order algorithms and things like that, right? Um, I don't expect those like functions that I wrote. I, I don't expect any of those extension points to be passed to higher order functions. That's, that's literally the reason. Also, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> but that was it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely could have done that. And I mean, I, I could probably switch to it right now because, you know, I mean, why not? But I also have some other problems in that push was previously like a regularly named function. Um, and so this is kind of the same problem that stood swap has is that uh, there are users of std swap who can't who like took the address of it and stuff like that, right? And so, I mean, I don't think anyone took the address of soul stack push, but if somebody did, I would break them if I switched. And so, you know, it's, it's those kind of considerations, right? So, yeah. But I mean, it's it's also it's primarily because like I don't expect anyone to pass, pass soul stack push to a higher order function, right? There's there's it's, it's, there's no like none of that is like good for like chaining or like monadic anything, right? So yeah. So I was actually under the false impression that you did have a function object uh, that would dispatch. And the reason that's a really good idea is because you don't have to do the two-step. Like, y yes, you can just call it through ADL, but telling users, just call, you know, colon, colon, sol3, colon, colon, push, that's what you call if you're actually using it, but that will internally call your customization point sol3 underscore lua underscore yeah. push, right? that allows you to actually tweak overload resolution whereas if you're just relying on a separately named function ADL you don't get that tweak uh, yeah, I, I, lose that, I lose that ability to, to change yeah. in so I, I was actually thinking you did that well the good news is that Soul3 is technically in beta and um, it is technically a breaking chain so I could totally do that um, with SoulStack push and SoulStack get and SoulStack check and check get and all those but um, yeah uh, we are on, for say, on break, though, so uh, if you want to go, you can totally go, but if you have some more questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. So, so what Gasper described is more or less what we, like, the, dif the difference between what we're doing and what, what you're doing is what Gasper described, that our Yeah, so, so uh, I guess I just wanted to mention the, the difference between what Thrust is doing and what Soul3 is doing is that uh, Thrust did define the, the, the kickoff points for these, these extension points to be function objects, whereas Soul3 just still has Soul Stack push and all those as regular functions. Um, maybe I should change that. I don't know. Um, we'll find out. Well, so I mean, aside from like the the past the higher order function stuff, um, you can uh, very much strictly control how ADL works. Um, in that, you know, you don't have to have this push function that could eventually end up in like somebody else's like call or whatever, right? Um, and so, by having a function object, you ha now have control over like what that call actually ends up doing, right? You can also take bugs in other people's libraries. The, the the key thing here is that is that a function object is not a candidate for ADL. Like the difference between like a function object and a function is that you can find the function by ADL. You can't find the function object by ADL. All right. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you all for coming.